Jeremy. Um, obviously, I'm a woodblock printmaker. I'm also an artist and painter um, and do lots of other things too. But so I'm mostly known, I think, now as a woodblock printmaker. So what I thought I'd do is just do a quick run through my 25 years as a printmaker. Um, there's a timeline. So the timeline um, just basically goes through. I, so I'm Scottish, I should start off by saying. Um, I'm Scottish, and I was born in a town called Alloa, which <laughs> kind of makes it appropriate that I'm somehow here with <laughs> Alloa as my background. Anyway, <laughs> Edinburgh University. I was a student there from 85 to 90, uh, where I did my MA. I lived in Paris for a couple of years. Um, I had a really strong interest in Japanese print, both at Edinburgh and living in Paris. And Eventually, I sort of decided I should go to Tokyo and learn how to do woodblock printmaking. So from 1992 to 99, I was, so six years, I was living in Japan. Um, I studied off and on with various people. Ralph was a great help. Um, I studied with uh, Seki Kenji, who used to be the uh, head printer at Doi Hangaten, which, is, uh, which was one of Tokyo's um, print houses. Uh, they, they mostly published prints by um, Koitsu and Hasui and so on. And that sort of links into the career that I ended up having because I was very interested in Shinhanga. That's the prints that were produced from about the period of the First World War right through to just after the Second World War, mostly the interwar period. And Shinhanga has been the, probably the biggest influence on my prints, as well as Ukiyo-e, but Shinhanga much more so. Um, I'll talk about this image that's on there in a moment, but I just put up so you have something prettier to look at than me. Um, I thought I would go through this and look at the different um, subject matters that interest me. Um, the, the, this basically breaks down into four main areas, the first of which is tattoo. Um, at Edinburgh, I was very interested in figure painting, figure drawing. Um, I did a lot of portrait work. So the human figure is something that's really a major part of my work. And it seemed logical that using the figure and connecting with a, a traditional Japanese subject would bring tattoo into it. So tattoo has been a big thing for me. Um, these two are um, part of an ongoing series, well, a, a series that just finished last year. Um, which is called um, Edozumi Hyakushoku, which is a hundred uh, shades of ink of Edo. And in the series, what I've done is I've used various uh, famous Edo period artists' work, turned into tattoos and layered onto the bodies of the models that I've worked with. So the left-hand one is Kuniyoshi and his cats, and the right-hand one is Yoshitoshi and his ghosts. And the series eventually grew to be um, 10 different subjects. Uh, the left one here is Kunisada. Um, Kunisada and the actor is Danjuro, so the print is Kunisada and Danjuro. And the right hand one is uh, Hokusai, and he did a very famous series of waterfalls. So Hokusai's waterfalls are the subject for that one. Um, in case you think they're all male, they're also females. So that in, within the 10, there are five male subjects and five female subjects. The left-hand one here is um, Hiroshige's Edo. So it's different views of Edo by Hiroshige. And the right-hand one is Utamara's Shunga. So the erotic prints of Utamara. And the tattoo on the girl's back is uh, Utamara print. So within this series, I played a lot of little games. I mean, I'm very much a playful artist. I think I like humor in my work a lot. So things like the, the little seals are actually the letters of my name rearranged into the forms of something that refers to the subject. So for example, in the, the Hiroshige prints, the seal is a carp. And it refers to one of the famous prints of um, Hiroshige's 100 Views of Edo, which is a koinobori, the, the carp banner that goes up on Boys' Day on the 5th of May. So the, the carp is rearranged into the letters of my name. <laughs> also at the top, the, um, the cartouche at the top with the, the title within the image 
reproduces the artist's signature. So it says Hiroshige, no. And then there's a little picture, and it's a picture of Edo from another print by Hiroshige. So there's layers of meaning in these prints, in this series particularly, where I'm referring to lots and lots of other things. But let's scamper on, so I don't want to be too long with this. Uh, my second subject was Kabuki. And uh, when I lived in Japan, uh, I was working at the Kabuki Zao Theater as an earphone guide translator. And actually translate because my Japanese were not that good. But I, if you go to the Kabuki Theater, and nowadays you, you get a little receiver and put it in your ear, you'll hear somebody talking to you about what's happening on the stage. So I was that person for a while in the 90s. <laughs> it seems a long time ago now. Um, this print um, is um, Ennosuke, who sadly has, actually I noticed the other day that virtually all the actors that I worked with are now dead. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, Ennosuke is now dead. Um, I did quite a few um, prints in this series, which is the Okubie series. So the first one was Ennosuke. This is uh, Jack Uemon, and the other one is uh, Danshiro, who was Ennosuke's brother. Um, I think Danshiro is still alive, but unfortunately the others are all dead. We'll, we'll move on from that. Um, I did a second series um, in Japan as well on kabuki subjects uh, called Heisei Yaksha Okagami series, which is uh, a great mirror of the actors of the Heisei period. And this one is uh, Bandu Tamasaburo, who is actually one of my favorite kabuki actors. He's an onnagata, so he plays female roles, and he's considered to be one of definitely one of the best of his period. Um, when I was there, so I, when I was in Japan, he was comparatively young. He's only a few years older than me, but that makes him quite old now, so we'll move on. Um, the third subject that I was interested in, and I became more so in the later part of my stay in Japan, was landscape. I didn't really do an awful lot of landscape previously, um, but this one is an example uh, from a series that was called the Shitamachi Setsugeka, so the, um, the snow, moon, and flowers of the Shitamachi, or the downtown part of Tokyo. And this one is um, the moon over Shinobazu, and Shinobazu is a pond. In fact, you can see the lotuses in the foreground of the pond that surround this little temple on an island, um, temple to Benten, and the island in Shinobazu Pond. Um, and the others were uh, the snow at Asakusa and the cherry blossoms at Ueno, which are very famous side job Paul you're waving at me. Yeah, you know, <laughs> about, about how many blocks for that one, Paul? This is not that many. This is probably about, um, I can't honestly now remember. I, I have a feeling it was about seven or eight blocks, but printed with perhaps about 20-ish colors, something like that. I mean, as time goes on, the, there are more and more blocks and they get more complex. Um, and some of the later, um, more recent ones are, are a lot more complex. But I was actually trying to keep it fairly simple. I mean, I know that sounds like quite a lot already, but I was keeping it quite simple at that time. Um, other Japanese landscapes. This um, is the Yomeimon at Nikko, so the, the, the main um, sh uh, shrines to the Tokugawa shogunate. And this is the, the Chinese gate. And the right-hand side is the uh, Yamadera, the mountain temple in Yamagata, up in northern Japan. And I was doing quite a sort of Hiroshige-type landscape again, with a very sort of high mountain temple and then a deep view to the valley below. But I think, again, these, these are quite a sort of Shinhanga-type design. Um, talking about Shinhanga. So Yoshida Hiroshi is uh, an artist that I'm very, very interested in. Um, this is his Grand Canyon view from uh, 1925. Uh, his dates are 1876 to 1950, as you can see. Um, one of the things that brought me into print was that I'm very interested as a collector in Shinhanga. So I collect Japanese prints as well. And Yoshida was somebody that I was very interested in collecting. About um, 10 years or so ago, I thought it might be fun to do a series where I was looking specifically at Yoshida and the things that he did in his own work. Um, so this is my version of Grand Canyon. It's called Cloud Shadows Grand Canyon. And I titled the series Meisho Tonotabi, which means travels with the master. So I'm sort of 
and sort of stalking him <laughs> 80 years later by going to the places that he went to in the 1920s or so on, and following the things that he did, and doing my own versions of the views that he did at that time. So here's a comparison between Hiroshi Yoshida and myself. Different, but you know they're not in such a very dramatically different aesthetic world, I think. Um, if you see the physical prints, Hiroshi's prints sort of, it's an Orban size print, it's that sort of size. My, mine is quite, quite a lot bigger. It's so big that I couldn't actually bring it with me to show you in person in the portfolio. But anyway, it's, it's pretty big. Um, I've done other things in the same series, the Meisho Tono Tabi series. Um, the left hand one is Lugano in Switzerland. Um, he did a, a horizontal view of Lugano, again in 19, I think that was 1926. And 1924, again, uh, he visited Niagara Falls, which is the right-hand side. Um, my Lugano is a, an Orban size, but the, the Niagara Falls is just as big as the Grand Canyon. It's a very large print, and it was a lot of work. And Paul, to let you know, that's about 40-ish colors. I mean, it was just... It was just massive. It was a lot of work. The Bokashi took forever. Anyway, so moving on. The last subject, the fourth subject that I, I deal with is uh, Bijinga, pictures of beautiful women. And I came to this quite late. It was actually after I left Japan that I started to work in uh, Bijinga. And in fact, this was uh, the first design in Bijinga that I did because it was a commission. I was commissioned by someone to do a set called The Four Seasons. And this was the first design of The Four Seasons. It's, it's, it has uh, combing the hair as the title, but it was produced as a print representing summer. She's wearing a light sort of cotton kimono rather than a, 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 a yukata rather than a heavy silk kimono, and she's meant to be on a sort of sunny summer day. So, Beijing have become something that has not maybe dominated my work, but it's certainly taken over to a large extent. So the sharp-eyed amongst you will notice that the left-hand one is the same as the woman with the tattoo that we saw earlier in the Edozumi Hyakushoka series. Um, I quite often do variations on the same design. Once you've carved the blocks, then why not print them in different colorways? So this version on the left-hand side uh, it's called Engawa. The previous one was called Utmaru no Shunga. So it's got exactly the same blocks, but without the tattoo. And the background printed in this sort of raspberry, reddish color. Um, and the, the right-hand side one is called uh, Cho Musubi, which is the, the bow, the butterfly-shaped bow on the back that the girl is wearing. Um, again, there's a reference. The, the kimono and the obi refer to um, a famous pair of screens. Um, by Ogata Korin that are held in the Moa Museum um, of the red and white plum blossoms with a, a river between. So it's a stylized version of the gold leaf and the river on her obi and then the, the plum blossoms in the, on her uh, kimono. A series that I'm working on now currently um, is called Shakunen no Hana and this series is a little bit different because the title means um, flowers of a hundred years and what I've done is I've taken the 20th century decade by decade to look at how women's lives have advanced in the 20th century rather than doing you know yet more pictures of pretty girls combing their hair or putting on their makeup I thought let's look at how women are different in the 20th century how that their lives are getting better the left hand one is called Moga, which is a modern girl. So she's cut her hair, she's smoking, and she's drinking Manhattans with another person. So we can suggest that perhaps there's a male companion, and she's a bit free, she has her own money. She's somebody who has a bit of independence from the family home. The girl, and she, sorry, she represents 1920. And the girl on the right-hand side, um, it's called Protest March. And this represents 1960. And it's a protest against the government of the time and also against uh, nuclear proliferation in Japan. Protests against nuclear weapons being kept in uh, American naval bases in Japan. So within the series, I've looked at things like women's education 
um, universal literacy, the rights of women to vote, and so on. I mean, it sounds quite boring, quite boringly academic, but I thought I wanted to break away from doing the sort of typical decorative views of women to do something that was a bit more about women's real situation. Um, occasionally I take commissions. I said that before I had done the commission of the Four Seasons set, this, this print was another commission, um, Ho no Yume. So it means um, Phoenix Dream. Um, it was commissioned by a gallery in Switzerland where I was doing a show, and in fact, I then fitted it to her more carefully. And you'll see that things like the kimono design have changed and so on, and the color scheme is very different to the previous one. So using the woodblocks to make color variants is something that's really quite important my practice. A new series that I've been working on recently also um, is called Hongadori and uh, this is a play on words because in Japanese poetry um, Hongkadori is, is a, a word that forms a bridge between two different ideas in Japanese poetry. So Hongadori is uh, an image that forms a link from the past to my own work and what I've done with this is I've taken original old woodblocks that I found, usually with dealers or in antique shops and so on, and transformed them into a basis for my own print. So the left hand one is called Casa Umbrellas, and the, the guy has a tattoo on his back, which is actually printed from an early 18th century woodblock. I found the key block for what I think was probably a fan print of the 18th century. It's quite a roundish design, and I thought that would fit quite nicely as a tattoo design on the back of this model. So the tattoo that he has is printed from an original 18th century block. And on the right-hand side, um, it's uh, the, the background there, the, the print title is uh, Hagoromo, which is, a, it means a feathered robe. It's also a title of a null play. But the tree uh, with the robe hanging over again comes from an 18th century woodblock, from the, the I think from the Tory school in that case. But I found this block and thought, how can I use this to make a print? So I turned it into a screen design behind the girl. You can't see it very well here, but when you see the portfolio presentation, I've got this print with me, and the, the pale turquoise robe is deeply embossed with feathered design as well. So again, she's wearing a feathered robe. There's a feathered robe over the tree behind, and it sort of brings in the connection between these two things. Again, I like playing games. <laughs> Jigoku Dayu is the hell courtesan. And the, in traditional versions of this story, she encounters um, a, a famous priest, and from that, the priest understands that she has more of a meaning, uh, more of a, a perception of, of heaven and hell than he does himself. In my version of it, um, she has a robe that's covered in the figures in hell itself. Um, you've got Emma, the, the king of hell, down at the bottom left, and then various demons torturing the souls of the people condemned to hell on her robe. Um, she's also got a hand that's wizened away to a sort of skeleton, so it's just a slightly humorous kind of image. The left hand one, uh, sorry, the right hand one is, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, a commission that was given by Amherst College in Massachusetts. They had um, a single sheet 18th century print by Shuncho, and they wanted artists to make a collaboration in a way with an 18th, with a, an old print. So I chose a Shuncho print, and instead of doing um, a completely Japanese image, I decided to import somebody in a sort of an impossible invented history, import an 18th century lady into a Japanese situation. But of course, Japan was close to the outside world at this time. Nobody knew what people were wearing in France in the 18th century. But this is a French 18th century costume transported into a sort of 18th century Japanese garden. Um, playing games. So just in case you think everything is kind of shin ish um, <laughs> My, my last image, this is a very new print, and I just did it um, a couple of months ago. Um, these cranes are of the very latest design, I just discovered. Um, the, the newest cranes that are in use in Tokyo, and although I've put it against quite a pretty background, um, it's a very simple and much more sort of creative print, Sosaku print style than the Shinhaga stuff I normally do. So, the 
that's just to show that um, there is a bit more. Good. Okay. I think that's about it. Um, does anyone have any questions? What uh, what kind of woods are you, you using? So the key blocks are um, cherry wood on a Sheena core, mm. and most of the color blocks are Sheena, unless there's lots of detail, in which case I might use the same like cherry and, and Sheena. Mm. But I find that Sheena is good for, for large areas, flat areas of color, because the grain doesn't come through so much. And I try to avoid using grain except for specific reasons. Mm. I mean, if I'm using an area where I want grain, then I'll use it, but I tend to want to print flat. You get your wood from Japan? Yes, it all comes from Japan. It's, it's from, from Matsumura, actually. Yeah. We were talking about that. We talking about that job before. Right. Hi, um, Paul, I wanted to ask you, what is the brand of your pigment? Is it, <laughs> is it paste or, or like a powder? So I use, I use a mix of different things. I use some Nihonga pigments. And so Nihonga is a Japanese uh, water-based painting, for those who, who don't know it. And it's very useful because it's, it's quite opaque. Uh, a lot of it's mixed with gofeng, which is the uh, white, um, Chinese white shell powder. Um, I also use um, powder pigment, normal Western powder pigment. I sometimes use gouache, which is already made up in tubes. I sometimes use um, watercolor. It just really depends. I mean, I don't, I'm not strictly sticking to only one kind of pigment. So it's a mix of different things. Really. But the, the blacks and grays are usually sumi. Can I come back to you in one second? Um, yes, I wondered, uh, can you say a little bit more about why Shinhanga? <laughs> because I love it. I think, OK, so I came to Shinhanga f mostly because, as a collector, it was the thing that really appealed to me. And because I think when you're, when you're handling things on a daily basis, when you're buying things, you're looking at them all the time, you can't help but have that as an influence in your work. And it was definitely the thing that that drew me because I was interested in collecting those things and therefore that became the thing that I was looking at most. And then therefore that had a knock-on effect into what was influencing my work. And I sort of fell in love with Shinhanga because there is a mix of very, very fine technique and traditional Japanese aesthetic melded to a slightly Western view as well. And I think somebody like Yoshida Hiroshi, he starts off being Japanese by birth but he is trained as a Western artist. He trains as an oil painter and watercolorist, and then goes into print. And in the same way, so I was born in the West, trained as a Western painter, and then went into Japanese print. So we're sort of meeting somewhere in the middle, and I thought that connection was quite interesting. So he specifically became somebody I was very, very interested in. And then also, people like Hasui and Shinsui and Kotonga and all the other artists of the, the same period. Sorry, you asked? I was uh, just wondering um, about your on the floor um, to print and I think you came to my place in, in Sendagai and I was all sitting on the floor printing away and doing all that. Um, I used to do that but um, I moved to London in 1999 and for a very short time I tried sitting on the floor but it was it's so painful in my legs I can't do it for very long so I sit on the chair and I print at a table. Okay. And uh, do you, how do you control the humidity because uh, in Finland um, Oh, you should so come to London. It's not that dry. <laughs> <laughs> it's really not that dry. Oh, <laughs> Rains yes. all the time in England. <laughs> yeah. There have been times when it does get quite dry. Like in winter in England, it can be quite dry. So in the morning, I tend to just mist around with a Mister, and if I find that the, the air is getting a bit dry, well, because I also keep house plants as well, so that helps keep a bit of moisture in the air too. Um, I don't find humidity a particular problem because the paper has to be damp, but I don't have to be damp. <laughs> <laughs> That's not such a big deal for me. So, but you know, I, I, I'm very different to John. I don't keep my paper dry day after day, uh, damp day after day. So, I, at the end of my printing day, I dry everything. And then the next day I'll damp it in the morning and then print it and then dry it again. Oh. 
I was talking with John about this. That when I'm doing the, my, so my standard edition size is about 100, and I split it into two halves and print the first half one day, the second half the next day. So while the first day is drying, I'm printing the second day. And then when the second day is drying, I'm printing the first day again. So, you know, you alternate day by day, and it's just much easier. So the humidity, I've never really found that to be a problem. I, I don't also don't use central heating during the winter because that does tend to dry things out. Like if you're working on a, a wood block and with central heating, it's, it's impossible. It dries out really fast. So I, I tend to freeze in the winter time, <laughs> sit, sit under a blanket yeah, when I'm doing it. Sounds very Lebanese. <laughs> I would say that's probably it. Put up with it. <laughs> and uh, following your edition, yeah, it seems like you do it all at once. You don't do a sample of it. I used to do this, do you know, I used to, in some of the early things, particularly with kabuki prints and so on, I produced 30 or 40 at first. And then I would be caught out because i suddenly go, oh God, there's none of these left and people want them and I've got a show. And so nowadays, nowadays I don't do that. I just print a whole lot at once. So it means I've got a big, I mean, basically it's an architect's drawing chest on top of an architect's drawing chest and it's full of prints just because I now produce a whole edition at once. Plus then you get a sort of regularity, like everything from number one to number 100 is the same, more or less. You know, so there's slight variant, but not so much. Yeah, John. Yeah, uh, could you speak about the last, you've been doing this for 30? 25, come on, 30. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but this Western interest in this, I mean, what are some of your observations about how that's kind of opened up in the West. I mean, I, I think there's a perception in, in Japan that some of what we do is, is a little old-fashioned. I mean, but it's, it's definitely old-fashioned. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, but you buy into that. That's for the I mean. West, it's so delightfully exotic sometimes, too. Yeah. So I, I was just kind of curious about the last 25 years. Things have definitely changed, I think. Um, not always for the better. Because I think, honestly, when I started in the early 90s, it was just at the end of the bubble period in Japan, and people were rich, and Japanese buyers were buying woodblock prints from all over the world, and so on, but then, you know, the bubble burst, and the Japanese economy has not been great for the last, well, nearly 25 years. So the Japanese buyer market is not there. The Western interest in prints is kind of flowing on, and maybe getting a little bit stronger, but it's not, it's not an overwhelming interest. Um, it's a, it's a small minority interest, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's, that's okay. Um, I would say, I think there are some individual collectors and, and museums who are keeping, sort of collecting market. And I think we'll talk more about yeah, this in our, in our this, talk. This, this evening, from yeah. 7 to 9, we'll, 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 we'll talk about that. on a panel and Tula and Ruth, so there'll be lots to talk about there. Yeah. So maybe we'll talk more about that at that point, but yeah, that definitely does exist. If I had a dollar for the times that people mentioned Paul Jacquelet, <laughs> no, he is not. <laughs> um, I think Paul Jacquelet was very lucky because he had enough money that he could employ carvers and printers and he can use very lovely techniques like we were talking about pearl and gold leaf and all of this. Um, I'm not a massive fan of Paul Jacquelet. I think his drawing was sometimes a bit not so good, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for the idea of a foreigner working in Japan, I mean, there were quite a lot of others in the 20s and 30s who were doing it. Um, Elizabeth Keith, um, Charles Bartlett, um, oh, there, there's so many, there's about half a dozen people who were also doing that, but Jacqueline is the one that people tend to know. So I would say I'm interested in Keith and Bartlett, I'm not so interested in Jacqueline. No. Um, maybe we will stop there, and if you want to ask Paul or Downstairs. Lunch is downstairs for anybody that has a red tag. Lunch is provided.